imagine that each morning when you wake up, you're smiling and looking forward to your day, knowing that you're happy, even while dealing with grief and loss. The Grief and Happiness Podcast inspires, comforts, and supports you with each new episode. For more support, check out the Grief and Happiness Handbook and Cards. I welcome you to listen to this podcast and discover endless possibilities for your life. Aloha. I'm so happy that you've come to listen to the Grief and Happiness podcast today. We love to come to you every week and bring you all kinds of different guests who have good stories and and things to tell you about the uh, everything that has to do with grief and happiness. So <laughs> today my guest is Cindy Burns in beautiful Virginia. And I, Cindy, it's so nice that you're here. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I am the mother of six adult sons. Mm. And unfortunately, we lost my husband on August 2nd, 2011. And I thought I was doing really well, you know, with the with my grief. I went back to work about two weeks after we lost him. And he had terminal lung cancer. Mm. And it was a short illness. He was diagnosed in May and died in August. So it was, it felt a lot longer than it was. Looking back on it, of course, you know, the timeline, it wasn't very long at all. But um, I thought I was doing really well. And about six years later, my children were all adults. They didn't need me as much as they had in the past. I had retired and I had no reason to get out of bed in the morning. And there were days when I didn't. And I was in that a really dark place, wasn't taking care of myself. And finally, I don't even know how long I stayed there, but I I finally came to the realization that I could live another 10, 20, maybe even 30 years if I was lucky. And I didn't want my life to be like that in 10, 20, or 30 years. So I knew I had to do something. And um, I did see my doctor and was treated for depression and anxiety. And I was very, very lucky that the first combination of medications that they put that he put me on worked. That's not always the case. And so I was very lucky in that. And then I set about trying to figure out who I was and and what my reason for for being still on this planet was. So I believe that we all have a purpose and purpose can change over time. And my purpose for so many years had been to be a wife and mother. And now it was I had I had to rediscover who I was and It was an interesting journey, and I came to the realization, a bunch of several um, side, took off a little bit, side trails, but eventually I I realized that my goal in life was to, or my purpose in life was to help other people who were in that place, that dark place, and help them to come out of that and... um, find their new purpose and find out who they were. And so that's what I've been doing. Wow. You know, your story is not unusual at all. That that seems like when I've had two husbands die and when the first one died, that was kind of like mine. Because I I had given up, we we owned a, a business together, a theater and school of arts and cafe and, uh, art gallery it was it was a fabulous thing that we did that I just loved but I got to the point where I I couldn't do it well because he was sick for a long time and so I was fortunate enough to donate all that into the nonprofit organization that we'd also started to make sure that anybody who any kids who wanted to take classes there at the school of arts would be able to do it that, that 
cost wouldn't keep them away, that they'd be covered. And so I, I went to them and I said, what would you think about me gifting you this entire thing? And they said, yes, please, we understand. And it, it worked out really well. But what that had, as much as I loved that, I had been home with my husband for two years and they'd gone on and they were doing very well with it. They didn't need me anymore. And I wasn't really part of it anymore. And so I was, okay, now what do I do? So I, I understand that completely. I spent a lot of time just sitting and thinking, I just, I just don't know what to do. I, I think a lot of us, and, and since you're a grief coach, I'm sure you can relate to this. A lot of us have no plans for what would happen if, if our loved one died. Right. Right. And then, wow, what do we do? So, <laughs> and I try to talk to those whose spouse is still there with them. Yes. You know, because we don't talk, we're, as a society, we're so afraid of death and dying that we don't talk about it. That's right. And there's, there's not really any way you can prepare yourself for grief. But if you know what to expect, it makes it a little easier when it happens. You're not so you're not taken by surprise. That's right. I've heard people tell me I I thought I was the only one who felt this way or had this experience. Yeah. Yeah. When you find out that that you're not the only one, if you're lucky enough to get into a community, you know, with other widows or widowers and people who are grieving anything, it really is kind of liberating to know that you're not the only one you wish the other people hadn't gone through it mm -hmm. just as you wish you'd hadn't but it's nice to know that what you're feeling you're not crazy mm -hmm. <laughs> you haven't lost your mind yeah, yeah i i found that i like to be around people who got me you know yeah. <laughs> that that since we had this commonality that we would just assume we didn't have we we did have it and they understood when I'd say something like, I, I couldn't wash my hair today, you know, <laughs> yeah. whatever it is, that nobody would uh, criticize somebody else in the room because uh, they had all had similar experiences. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's a club nobody wants to join, but it's very helpful to find other members of the club. Yes. Uh, that's that's a really good way of putting it. Yeah. So how did you actually become a grief coach? What did you do? The whole thing was kind of um, strange. <laughs> I was trying all kinds of things. I um, sold makeup, you know, and, uh, direct sales. And I don't wear makeup. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, um, I tried to, uh, I joined the local art club. I can't draw stick figures. <laughs> I tried all these different things because, well, the art thing was, that was my husband. He was an artist. Mm. So I think that was kind of my way of maybe trying to connect. I think the the direct sales was to just be around other people, you know, to make new friends. And because, you know, friendships change mm -hmm. when you become widowed. And so I was trying to make new friends and I did, I made new friends, but it wasn't, it wasn't what, you know, selling makeup wasn't what, what yeah, we that's not the way you so wanted to do it. Yeah. I, I was terrible at it because I didn't care that much. Mm -hmm. So somebody online in one of the groups I was in mentioned something about becoming a life coach. So I asked her a little bit about it and I did a little research. And the first course that I actually looked at was a life purpose coach. Ooh. And I knew what I was searching for was a purpose. So I thought, well, this is synchronicity. It's meant to be. Mm -hmm. So I took the course and I found out by the end of it that I actually knew everything that they were teaching. I just hadn't applied it to myself. Yeah. So I applied it to myself and realized that this is what I this is what I really wanted to do. It's what I needed to do. And it was something that I think 
would feed my soul. My my why would have been big enough to to really um, whether I succeeded or failed, just doing it would have been enough. And um, so that's what I started out where I was um, calling myself a life coach for the widow or for widows. Then I had um, a gentleman ask me, well, do you take men? So then I was a life coach for the widowed. Mm -hmm. And then I had people um, say, well, what about me? I'm divorced. I grieve too. Or, you know, I lost my mother last year. You know, can you help me? And so then I realized that there's all kinds of grief and you can get stuck in that grief, no matter what it is, what causes it. it could be the loss of a friendship. It could be moving to a new town and having to leave all those friendships, maybe even the house that you loved behind, you know, all kinds of things. That's, you know, and um, so now I'm a grief coach and I, I just kind of, it, it encompasses everything, I think. But I also am certified as a happiness coach. Oh, wonderful. So, yeah. And that's, that's my grief coach sounds so kind of depressing and it's so much more than that. I help people find their new purpose. I help them find a reason to get out of bed in the morning. It's very, a, it's a very simple process. It's just not always easy. Mm -hmm. yeah. I help them um, learn to dream again. Well, mm -hmm. first, first, I have the very first thing is you have to feel your feelings. Mm -hmm. You have to acknowledge the grief, and you have to let it process. And eventually hopefully sooner rather than later, you come to a point where, okay, what's next? And the what's next is finding out who you are now, learning to, to know yourself again, because you've changed. You know, you're not the same person you were before. And so you've got to, you've got to learn who you are now and get to know that person and love that person. And Along with that, you learn to dream again. Because, you know, when we lose someone that's dear to us, we lose the future we thought we were going to have with them. And it's not always easy to think of a future. It's not always easy to dream. And so when we can do that, and when we know who we are, that makes it a little easier to find our new purpose in life. So it's a simple yeah. process. It's a four-step process. It's just not easy. <laughs> I love that. It's it's so wonderful to have something tangible. You know, it's this is a process, and you can do it, and I can support you through it. And at the end, things are going to be different. I yeah. love that. That's so so wonderful. And I like to tell people that wow, of course, I wish my husband was here with me now. I like who I am and I really love my life. I love people ask, well, don't you want to get married again? No, mm -hmm. <laughs> I love the independence and the freedom I have now. And it would take a very, very special man to make me, you know, want to bring somebody else into my life. And if God wants that to happen, then he'll put him in front of me. I'm not going to go looking for it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love that. I he, we have so much in common because after my first husband died, I, I said I we'd been married 22 years and I had a wonderful married life and he was absolutely great and I couldn't imagine anybody else would be as great as he was and I had no intention of ever getting married again. And then I just happened to meet Ron and we we got together. However, I, I don't know how you think about this, but I, and he, he was not too long after we were together, he was kind of talking about marriage. And I said that, you know, I'm, I'm not ready for that. I, I can't go there. And I realized it was because I didn't feel unmarried. Oh, yeah. And 
that I thought about that a, a lot. I really had to work my way through. It took me four years. <laughs> We've been yeah. dating for four years before I finally said that uh, I was ready. Because I can see it, that. Yeah, it, it just, you know, after 22 years with someone, I know it, it in traditional vows, it says, till death do you part. But I, I don't, I still feel him in my heart. Mm-hmm. You know, I still grieve for him. And now I have two people that I grieve for in, in my heart, two husbands. And that's why my last name is Thoreau Threat, because those are my two last names I had being married. And I didn't want to give either one of them up. I don't don't want to choose. You know? Right. I am. Um, one of the best stories I've heard. It, it wasn't a story from anybody I knew, but somebody told me of a couple who they were both widowed and they met and got married. And she said to her new husband, you do know that if Bob or whatever his name was, you know, were to suddenly miraculously come back, it'd be bye bye to you. And he said, oh, yeah, he says, I agree. The same thing for me. <laughs> so, that's really interesting. I haven't heard something like that before. <laughs> that that's yeah. re- I can get that. Yeah, it's not it's not that you're replacing, you know, your first love. It's in addition and I, so I think with, in that case, I think it was the same way that the, maybe they had, didn't feel unmarried. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah. yeah. That sounds like something I should write on unmarried. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, Dan and I were married just a month shy of 33 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, I know when, when I was growing up, I figured I'd be married forever. Yeah, I, I had uh, the, the privilege of being able to be at my parents' 50th wedding anniversary celebration. And I thought, I'm going to do that, too. Well, I've been married over 50 years, but I wasn't to the same person. So I didn't get that 50th wedding ceremony yeah. or uh, anniversary. Yeah. You mentioned that, that you were happiness. Tell me about that. Approach. Basically, it's all about finding little moments of joy and choosing to be happy because we can choose, you know, we can choose to be miserable or we can choose to be happy. It's all how you look at it. And I don't let negativity into my life. I don't let, I don't surround myself with negative people. Especially online, it's easy enough to unfriend somebody that's, you know, all about the drama. And I've said many times that I don't do drama unless it's on a stage. There you go. (laughs) You you were saying about your um, your arts. Mm -hmm. That would have been my I would have been in heaven with that doing that. That would have been my my dream. I was a theater geek. In oh. high school, and um, I went to college, and my parents talked me out of majoring in drama, and so I only lasted uh, three semesters, and then I dropped out because I couldn't oh. figure out what I wanted. But it all worked out the way it was supposed to. I met my husband about a year later, and so you know everything worked out the way they were. It was supposed to. That that's really interesting because. When um, I I changed career paths a few times <laughs> in in oh, my yeah. Yeah. in my education, I started out in theater and then switched over to nursing because I I felt like I needed to have something that I could support myself with if if mm-hmm. I had to do that. And then when I I moved and the college the new college didn't. Wouldn't accept. They accepted the credits for our courses, but they didn't accept the course. And so I was going to have to start all over again oh dear. To, to get my bachelor's degree. And it was going to take me five years. And I was like a year away from graduation. And I thought that that means that I would have been in school long enough to be a doctor. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I didn't want to, to do that. So one of the I don't know how they they found out about this, but uh, one of the the teacher in the that was in the 
drama department, or not drama department. He, oh, that's right. He was an English counselor, and I had uh, tried majoring in English because I thought I could do something with that. I don't know what I was thinking. But he, he said, I know your passion is theater. I want to introduce you to the theater person here on campus. So I met him and he said, well, if you want to change your major to theater, then we have a scholarship that you can have because we need to have like reentry students who are, are coming back. So I graduated with my degree in theater and I said, oops, <laughs> I, I love the process. It was absolutely wonderful to do that, but I couldn't figure out what in the world I would do with a degree in theater because I knew I didn't want to teach. I had been substitute teaching for a while and I had thought I wanted to teach until I did that. And I thought, I can't put up with this. I just, <laughs> I just yeah. can't do that. So I, I went back to that English teacher that got me switched over to a theater and I said, can I get into the, because I've got a pretty good English background, can I get into the graduate program in English? And he said, I think so. So he introduced me to the person and I did get into it. And my path was really different than all the other students because I really, I was working on dramatic literature and that wasn't what everybody else was doing. So it did, however, lead me to my writing career because they had a, a like a, a, I can't think of the name of it, but it was in writing. You could graduate with the oh, concentration. You could graduate with a concentration in writing, even though it was an English degree. And so I was able to do TAs in, in the graduate program and get a lot of experience with teaching writing. And I, I was teaching writing actually before I got my degree. I love to write as well. <laughs> oh, well, it was it was amazing because it, it really led me down a different path that I had no idea that I would get there. And it's been fabulous. And the writing has helped me so much. I love teaching those students. That really worked for me. But all the writing that I was doing led me to write two or actually three college textbooks. Uh, that that showed me because I didn't before that I wasn't sure I was a writer, but that that showed me if I'm writing books on teaching other people how to write, yeah, uh, I must be. So I was so glad I did that because when after Ron died and I was going, oh, what am I going to do now? I started writing about it, not for anybody else to read, but I could really get into the writing. And I got so much out of it. I thought I could help other people by teaching them how to do this specific kind of writing. And everything came from there. Yeah, I often recommend that people journal. In fact, I, I have a guided grief journal that I offer oh. for free. And I tell people, even if you're not a writer, you know, even if you hate writing, you don't have to actually write. Just use the prompts to think. Mm-hmm. You know, to to kind of gather your thoughts. And but there is something about and especially journaling, I think putting pen to paper, not so much fingers to keyboard, mm -hmm. pen to paper. It really helps your thoughts flow. And if you if you just write off the top of your I think when we type, we're more apt to self-edit. Mm -hmm. Whereas when we're writing, it's more free flow and we don't we don't edit as we're writing. We just go with it. And I think um, I think that it's really helpful to to process your thoughts and to process your feelings. And, you know, it just kind of gets it out there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I have filled up so many journals. I when it's back to school time, I stock up on the composition uh. <laughs> books and then I use those. I've, I've got piles of them that I've actually filled up. Oh, wow. And and I love that. And what you're saying about putting pen to paper, it makes all the difference in the world. It is. Yeah. And especially since I taught writing, I've, I've got the first computer lab for writing on my campus because I, I just believe students could do so much better if they didn't have to go back and rewrite, retype the whole thing. Yeah. And they did, and it worked really well. <laughs> and it's great for that kind of writing. But 
the the writing when you're you're soul searching or yeah. when you're uh, writing from from the heart when you mm-hmm. yeah. heart centered writing really yes helps. yeah absolutely and and that's that's a pen to paper yeah oh, I I love how how you uh, do that too we've got so much in common that's that's really cool <laughs> I know it's amazing we haven't met before <laughs> this is great yeah. Uh, I'm looking at your book there, The Grief and Happiness Handbook. I have not seen that. I'm going to have to get a copy of that. Oh, good. Because <laughs> it, it, it sounds, you know, like it would be something that would be very useful in my practice. It it would be. Um, I have two books that are actually, when I wrote my the book to start off with, it had 52 chapters, and that's another long story of how I got to 52 chapters. But my, the contract I signed with my publisher was for the number of words and that I'd written in these 52 chapters. And when they sent it to the editor, the editor contacted me and said, we, we can't publish something this long in this field because statistically it will not sell. It doesn't matter how good it is. And she says, do you want to edit it or do you want me to edit it? And I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> I liked all 52 chapters. Yeah. So I ended up, the first book is the first 26 chapters, in Loving and Living Your Way Through Grief. And the second book is the, the second 26 chapters. And one of the things about separating them out over a couple of years before I published the second book was I learned how I thought the the format of the book would be so much better because I've got at the end of each chapter in the Grief and Happiness Handbook things that you can actually do and there's room to actually write them in the book. Oh, that's nice. That and my first publisher wouldn't let me do that. I could I could write them, but not leave room in the book to do it. And they guided me away from doing it the way that I wanted to. So this one I like a lot better because it's a, that pen to paper thing. Yeah. That I, I think really helps a lot. And in the meantime, I had started the Grief and Happiness Alliance, and we've got the Grief and Happiness Alliance nonprofit organization that goes along with that so that they can fund the the gatherings that I have on Zoom so that people that come don't have to pay for it. Oh, nice. And so I approached them and I said, why don't we go through a publisher? It's it's kind of a hybrid self-publishing. We're not really self-publishing. They're doing all all the the work and I'm doing all the writing and and it was a combination but it turned out to be exactly how, what I wanted what I wanted it to look like and since it's the grief and happiness alliance and nonprofit I thought the grief and happiness handbook would be just perfect for that yeah. so the both books work together really nicely and there's just more in the what you can do at the end of the chapters in this one that makes it into a, a handbook and all, all the proceeds from it go to the nonprofit. Uh, actually from all my books and my uh, cards that I do go to the nonprofit. My goal is to my my big dream is to build my business up so that I make enough money so that I can fund a nonprofit to help widows who make too much to get government help, but not enough to really live on. Mm -hmm. And because there's an awful lot of those people out there. And I talk to them daily. I have a, a free Facebook group and when you don't have enough money to pay somebody to help you, you go to the free Facebook groups. Mm-hmm. And some of the stories are heartbreaking. There is um, a young mother. Well, I say young. She got married her senior year in high school because she was pregnant. They were married 19 years and they had three children And she was a stay-at-home mom the entire time. He said, you know, I make enough. You don't have to work. And they didn't plan for him, you know, dying. It it was a car accident, and he was in a coma for weeks Mm. before he finally passed. And um, she didn't even have a high school diploma. 
you know, and wow. it was, she is working now. Thank goodness. She did find a job and it's, it's in it's a work from home job. So she's able to stay home with, you know, her youngest child. So it, it, it all kind of worked out, but for a while there, it was very scary for her. She thought she, you know, she was going to lose their house. And then I've had, you know, especially older women who they don't plan and they've just got social security, you know, and it, even when you both work, when one, when one dies, you're left with one salary, one paycheck, but the same amount of bills. Mm -hmm. Your bills don't get cut in half because somebody dies. And there have been, there have been times when people have had to make a choice between, you know, paying the, the mortgage or buying their medicine or, you know, buying food. And it's nobody should have to make those kind of choices, especially when they're grieving. Yes, I agree with you. I, I love your concept for the a nonprofit, and I would encourage you to do it sooner rather than later. Because if you wait until you have enough money to do it, it might not ever happen. Yeah, yeah. People have told me that that you can that I could start it with no money from myself. That if I get mm -hmm. donations and whatever, so I'm I'm gonna I think I am gonna start looking into it to see what what all it in, would entail. Because it really is something that, again, the work I do feeds my heart. And I think this also, you know, it feeds my soul, the idea of it. And yeah. I, I love it. I, just, I really love it. And it's not as hard as it used to be to have, do a nonprofit. I, I told you about the one that I had with the theater. That took about a year and a half. And it was a pain in the neck. I, it was, I think I had everything done and they'd say, well, now do this. And it just, it was cumbersome to try to be working on that with everything else I was doing with the theater at that point. But when I wanted to start this one, I was in a, a group online and I said something about uh, wanting to start a nonprofit. And I knew this one man and the, the group had a nonprofit for something else. And so I said, how, how did you start? And he, he said, uh, well, I knew a guy and he, he was able to do it all. And it, it was interesting. So he gave me the name of that person and I would be happy to pass it on to you. Oh, that would be wonderful. And he, uh, it, you know, cost, but it didn't cost a whole lot. And you, you can like talk to him and find out how much it's going to cost. And when you've got that much money, you can get it started. And in the meantime, you can be working on all the, the things to, because it's a process. It does take a little while. You have to, to wait for government things, for, and they're not particularly fast. But that gives you the, the opportunity to build up who's going to be in the no, nonprofit, who's going to work on this with me, who, who, has, who would like to do this. And uh, I, I love having my nonprofit. I feel like I have another family with the, the people um. who are in it. And it's it's really good. So I would I really friend, encourage you. I have a friend who's very knowledgeable in um, grant writing, mm -hmm. and she's offered to help. So. Oh, that's wonderful. That that makes that's uh, something I don't have in my organization that I really would like. Because when there are so many grants out there that people don't even realize that they're yeah. there, and when you've got a good grant writer, that that can fund everything. Yeah. And with with grant writers, the way I've worked with them before is they write into the grant proposal what they're going to get paid for the, the doing the grant. Mm -hmm. And so when the grant's funded, they get paid. So that's oh. a real motivator to them to <laughs> yeah. you know, write to the right people and, and do it really well, because the, the better they do, the better the grant writer does. Yeah. Well, I didn't know that. Yeah. There's so much to learn. <laughs> mm -hmm. There is, but don't let that stop you because, you know, you, you learn it, you know, like you learn to walk one step at a time. You can't do it all at once. Exactly. Exactly. 
Well, I have loved this conversation with you. I, 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 just, I wish we lived closer and we'd just get together. And <laughs> well, I'll just have to come to Hawaii and visit. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fine. And I have actually had people come to visit me from um, a, a, one person bought my book and she she wasn't a, in my organization or anything, but she bought my book. And she contacted me and she said, I'm going to be on Maui. Can I meet you? Oh, nice. <laughs> I said, sure. And so when she was here, she invited me out to lunch. So I drove out to Lahaina, which isn't there anymore because of the fires. Mm-hmm. And I drove out there to meet her and her daughter. And it was it was wonderful. Just a wonderful experience. So, and I've, I've had a couple more things like that where, where people really want to meet me as long as they're here. So, <laughs> Well, I have another goal is to, I would love to do a rich, a widow's retreat and, you know, have, have all kinds of people come in and speak and, and just help them, you know, build them up and, and, and help start a new life and, or maybe not start a new life but help them to enjoy the life that they have. There you go. That's perfect. Yeah. I don't like the idea of moving on. I like it. I call it moving forward. Moving on feels like you're leaving something behind. Yes. Whereas moving forward, you're bringing it with you and you're just adding to it. I, I believe that completely. That that's, that's the way it is. We just do have so much in common and I'm, I'm, trying to figure out how to get a retreat done here on the island because if we do it here I know people would want to come so oh yeah yeah definitely definitely so I will keep you in mind as we move down that that path and maybe there's something that we could do together with our nonprofits as you do that too so there you go (laughs) well I am so glad we had this conversation today and I will have in, in the show notes uh, how you can reach Cindy and her her links and that sort of thing. So look for that and sign up. And, and you know, when, when you write reviews of what we're doing here, it makes a huge difference. The more of that we do, the, the more uh, we can do. Yeah. And I just found out and need to celebrate that, that my podcast is in the top five percent of podcasts in the world oh how wonderful so i'm just really excited about that so congratulations so you can say that you were on one of the top podcasts in the world so yeah and uh, uh, i don't know if i've given it to you but the i can give you the link to uh the guided grief journal as well if anybody's oh. interested that would be wonderful. So we'll put that in the show notes too, so that you can get your your copy for free there. Yes. And uh, I'm sure it's. I though I've not seen it. I'm sure it's wonderful because I really like Cindy and what she's doing and her philosophy and how she does it. So I encourage you to download that journal and take advantage of the things that Cindy can offer you. Okay. Well. Thank you, Cindy. Is there any last things you want to say or? Two main things I like to leave people with is feel your feelings and you don't have to do it alone. Yeah. If there's nobody in your life that can support you, if you feel like you're all alone, reach out online. There are so many grief groups on Facebook. There are all kinds of organizations. I mean, if it's not me and if it's not Emily, you know, there are other people out there. I know I'm not everybody's cup of tea. (laughs) And, but there are other people out there who are willing and able and just aching to help you. So if you, if you need help, don't, don't hesitate to ask for it. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Thank you so much for saying that. And to my listeners, we'll see you or hear you, (laughs) be with you, I guess we should say, (laughs) again next week with another episode of the Grief and Happiness podcast. And we invite you to our our Sunday gatherings also that, that are at no charge. So 
If you're interested, just drop me an email and I'll send you the information. Or go to the grief and happiness or griefandhappiness.com and you can find out there. So thank you for listening and aloha. Do you want more comfort and support and happiness? Join the Grief and Happiness Alliance at our free gatherings on Zoom every Sunday. Visit my website at griefandhappiness.com and read my books, The Grief and Happiness Handbook, and get your set of the beautiful Grief and Happiness cards. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast, rate it, review it, and binge listen to all of our episodes. I can't wait to welcome you back to another episode of the Grief and Happiness Podcast.